Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Tracy Muller. I'm Head of Fiduciary Advice at NetBank Wealth Management South Africa, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to host this webinar today. Whilst the pandemic has brought many challenges and sadly sorrows, it has also created opportunities. And when it comes to our money and financial matters, one such opportunity is, is that we're able to connect with you online as we are doing now. And when talking about connections and connectivity, the reality is that every single financial decision we make affects our ability to protect what is important to us and to achieve our life goals and aspirations. At NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning, we use our globally integrated advice-led approach to connect your financial decisions to your life goals and aspirations. Practically, this means providing clients with technical expertise, appropriate opportunities, global services and solutions across NetBank and other top providers. And most importantly, it's about connecting you to personal and objective advice to enable you to make better life decisions and avoid financial disasters. And this is in essence what we refer to as connected wealth. Before I hand over to Mapalo, who is our MC for today, just a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, a huge thank you to everyone online that submitted questions ahead of this session, because it really does help us when we're planning for webinars to really have an understanding for what's top of mind in your minds in terms of the particular topic that we're going to cover. So thank you for that. And we will be addressing those questions through the, the content of today. For everyone else on the line, though, please make use of the Q&A chat function to post any questions that you may have. And that will be on the left hand side of your screen. If your screen should freeze during this webinar, please don't panic. Just press the refresh button or the, F, um, the F5 key, and it should take you back to the place in the webinar where you lost connectivity. So from my side, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mapalo to introduce us to the other panel members for today and to position the, the, discussion, the topic for discussion. So over to you, Mapalo. It seems that we had a technical glitch but you know how it's going to be a good webinar when you have technical problems. Let us start from the beginning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NetBank Private Wealth and Financial Planning webinar. My name is Mabano Mapu. I'm a personal finance columnist and published author of a book called You Are Not Broke, You Are Pre-Rich. And here with me today, I have four experts who are going to help me tackle this topic, redefining retirement. And we have Tracy Miller, who is the Head of Fiduciary Advice at NetBank Wealth Management. We also have Tracy Jensen, who is the Senior Investment Analyst at NetBank Net Group Investments. And we also have Chidilo Ntetwa, who is the Wealth Management Advisory at NetBank Wealth Management. And of course, we do have a gentleman in this, in this webinar today. We have Grant Mentis, who is the Head of Trading, NetBank Private Wealth Stockbroking. So retirement is something we all need to plan for, regardless of the life stage you are in. The better our planning, the more we get to enjoy our retirement years. Today, our experts are going to go in depth on how to plan for retirement in each of the life stage. But before we begin, there is a poll that is running, and I would like you to complete this poll. I will share the results with you at the end of the session. A link to the poll is going to pop up in the chat, and the poll will open to a new tab so that you will still get to listen in on the webinar. If you should experience any technical problems as we have right now, do not dread. The technical team will put instructions in the chat box so that you are able to complete this poll. Now, let us get right into the business of the day. We know that 45 minutes, an hour is not long at all. So let us discuss stage one, first salary. And I'm going to start with you, Tracy J. As you see, we have Tracy, two Tracys, so I will be addressing them as Tracy J and Tracy M for clarity. Tracy J, what mistakes did you make when you first started working and what learnings can you share with the audience today? 
Thanks, Mpalu. So when I started my first formal job, I was on contract. There was no requirement to save for retirement. And I was living my best life, saving, investing, retirement. That was not on my radar. You know, it was entertainment and going out and shopping. I think almost every weekend I went shopping. You know, you've got to build up that working wardrobe. Um, and really, I studied investments and savings and this kind of thing. And it just was not on my radar. And I think that's the case for many people, especially when you start out, you're not earning a big salary. Saving can be very hard. And you have all these aspirations. A year into working, I was signed up as permanent. So I had to save for retirement. And I remember getting this form and saying, okay, how much do you want to save? And it just felt like a drag on my dreams. You know, I wanted to start the shoe line. I even had my slogan. It was going to be this beautiful line of high heels that was comfortable. And I'd started meeting with suppliers and saving towards retirement was just like, oh, this is just taking away from what I actually want to do and save for. So I ticked the lowest amount. I think it was 5% on, on the form. And I was like, okay, fine. I have to do this. Um, but the lesson I learned quite quickly, which I'll, I'll share with you a bit later, but is the sooner you start, the better, because the later you start, the more you have to contribute and put in to get to the same position. The sooner you start, the more that compounding and interest works for you. So I'm going to give a caveat to that. Enjoy your first year of working. I know this is a savings and investment webinar, but I think we work so hard to get there and study that it's actually good to enjoy it. I don't mean go into debt, but, you know, enjoy that income. After your first year, I'd really say it's time to get a bit more serious about saving and investing. And if you can set yourself up with the motto of save first and spend what's left, rather than what most of us do, which is, well, let's spend and whatever I've got left at the end of the month, I'll save. There's never anything left at the end of the month. And I've met with, you know, many, many people, even people who earn 100,000 a month who tell me they don't have money left to save. <laughs> so if you can set yourself up with that motto from the beginning, I really think you'll, you'll save yourself a lot of pain. And those dreams and aspirations you do have, you will have the savings there to be able to fulfill that. So those, yeah, that's a summary of my tips for when you're starting out. So that's fantastic, Tracy J. I love that it speaks to paying yourself first, isn't it? Pay yourself first, then you can get to enjoy your money. You have done the right things first with the first 10%, 20%, then you can buy the shoes, then you can um, really live your best life. I absolutely love that. So Tracy J, back to you again. If one wants to start investing and saving, where should they start at this stage? So I, I get this question quite a lot when I'm at Bryce or just going out. I think there's often a misconception that younger people don't want to save. I think they do, but it's a challenge of there's so many things out there and I just don't know where to begin. So the very first thing you want to do is to set up some kind of emergency savings. So this, as the name says, is for an emergency. I mean, we saw that with COVID. I think for a lot of people who didn't have this, it, it really came to bite them, unfortunately. But it's really for unplanned things. Maybe your car breaks down and you need a new engine. Two things more extreme, like losing your job and not having an income for a few months. So here you want to work towards saving up three to six months of your salary. And this money needs to be accessible because you don't know when you're going to need it. And generally, you would invest it in something that earns interest. So it's fairly low growth, but it's also low risk because you need it there for that unexpected scenario. So that's the first place to start. And then the second place, I mean, this is a retirement webinar, is to start saving towards retirement. Now, you want to eventually get to 15% of your gross salary that you're setting aside for retirement every month. Now, I know this, this might not um, be possible initially, but really I would aim to work towards it. And what behavioral experts tell us is commit to it now already for your salary increase, if you're fortunate to get one in these times. But it's easier to make the commitment now than when you get the increase. By the time you get the increase, you've already planned, oh, I'm going to sign up for DSTV and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. 
So really commit to, even if it's saying I'm contributing 5% now, I'm going to go to 8% if I get an increase. Um, so that's the second bucket. And the third one is to use something like a tax-free investment account. And the reason I say this is because, as I said, when you're young, you've got time on your side. That compounding can really, really work for you. So even if you can only put a small amount in, like 250 a month, the sooner you start with that, those returns are going to compound tax-free. So the benefit of that when you're older is just going to be phenomenal. So to recap, it's the three. It's your emergency savings, working towards saving 15% of your salary to retirement, and then starting a tax-free investment. Oh, I love that. And one of the things I really love about a tax-free savings account, I know oftentimes people complain that 3000 is not a lot, but that compounding effect over time is very, very, very powerful. So thank you so much for that, Tracy M. Now, Chililo, my question for you is two parts. When and where does one start planning for retirement at this stage? Thank you very much. Um, so I like what Tracy was saying when she was sharing her ex experience. The beautiful thing about hindsight is that it's got 2020 vision. But like she said, when we start working, we just want to go overboard. So my first point of starting would be consult a financial planner. Go to a trusted financial services provider and ask for a financial plan. As much as we can have, we can have ways of saying do one, two, three, four. As Tracy has already alluded to, our circumstances are different. Our responsibilities are different. Our goals in life are different. So consult a financial plan. I can never stop emphasizing this because there are professionals in financial planning. There are professionals in helping you to decide what is the best way to save, what is the best vehicle for, for you to save in, and how do you meet the responsibilities? The one of it is, I like what Tracy said, that you start, give yourself a year and enjoy, and then after that, then we start saving. I would go back to consulting your financial plan. What I really love is if you build the culture of saving from day one, if you pay the way you, you explained it, if you pay yourself first. So what happens then is that you already know that I earn a thousand rand. I'm a low paid worker. I earn a thousand rand. From that thousand rand, I take hundred rand and get and save it. Then I learn to live on 900 rand from day one. I know I meet my responsibilities from day one. It is a structured thing. That is why I always say start with your financial planner continue from there on. But we can never, ever undermine the effect of compound interest. A good man once said, money makes money, and the money that money makes, makes money. Which means that as you make money, the money that you are, you are growing, it continues to make money from you. You can never undermine the fact, the, the, the fact that the earlier you start, the better for you and you get used to not having that money to start with because it's part of your savings. Thank you so much, Bilo. So it is basically saying a financial planner is your accountability partner. It's exactly. They will help you through your financial planning life to get to your goals. So consult with them as early on as possible. Now, Tracy M., I want to come to you. When should you start thinking about estate planning? So, my Paula, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I look back and I look at this stage and I look back to when I was young and I first started working. And I think when you're young, you almost feel like you're invincible. You feel like, you know, death is never going to happen to you. It's something that's going to happen in many years to come. Um, but the reality is the minute we start accumulating assets, that's the time we need to start with estate planning. I think what's also important just to mention is that estate planning is a collective term that is used to really look at a whole lot of different components. So like, for example, the, the fundamental, the first building block is ensuring that one has a valid will. And the minute we start acquiring assets, that's when we need to make sure that we have a will that reflects how we would like our assets to devolve. And the mm -hmm. reason for that, Mapolo, is because a will, in essence, 
becomes our voice when we no longer have one. When we no longer are around, that will, that written document becomes our voice in terms of how we would like our assets to be devolved. And that's why for me, it's almost like a building block approach you have to follow in terms of estate planning, but it starts with the most important document we will all ever have, and that's making sure you have a valid will once you start acquiring assets. I think that is so important. And now that we are talking about this, I'm reminded that I have not put my five month old, I have not updated my will. <laughs> so I think for any parents who've had new kids in the family, a new addition, please go get your will done. And now, Krant, to you, how much should one contribute to their retirement at this stage? I think uh, my life story was slightly different to Tracy's. Um, I was quite firm on how much I wanted to start investing from the day that I started working. So I ticked the 10% box from day one. <laughs> and, um, and every two to three years, I, review that, I reviewed that uh, contribution percentage till I got to that 50% that you're allowed to do so. Now, in addition to that, I think when you're young, the first grudge purchase I always had to do was pay my insurance on my car because that was the only asset I had. And people should not be looking at your retirement contributions as grudge purchases. It's planning for that future stage. And uh, we've touched on one of the products that we can look at is tax-free. And we know that there's a 36,000 Rand annual contribution um, uh, limit on that. And currently 500,000 Rand over your life. But I think that will change in, in due course. But that it doesn't mean you have to invest 3,000 Rand a month. You can, you can look at your relevant tax-free product uh, and there are multiples available in South Africa which includes ETFs, so exchange traded products, which is a, a basket of shares similar to unit trusts, um, which is included. But I think the other thing that uh, Tilo mentioned was your financial, your financial advisor. And I think it's the additional product of a retirement annuity in addition to your forced purchase through your, your employer, where you set that additional contributions to. So you might want to say, listen, I want to keep my 10% on my my employer's contribution, and I want to grow my retirement fund contributions to the other additional 5%. But that's the way that discussion with your financial planner comes into play. What is your short-term goals? What's your long-term goals? What is your risk appetite at, at now? And it doesn't say when you start it. So when someone starts at 21, 22, when they've just finished varsity, their risk appetite is much larger. So that means they want to invest in riskier assets compared to someone like me or my father who's gone on to retirement, he wants no risk, he wants income guaranteed. So um, my guidance is always try and invest as much as, as, as you can up front, that 10%. We, we, I think we're, I'll talk about compound interest a little bit later on, but I think um, it's spoken around in the financial markets as the seventh wonder of the world, um, that money makes money that Silo mentioned, uh, but, but have that don't view retirement and, and contributions as great purchases. Still view your car insurance as a great purchase because it's, it's a necessity because you don't want to uh, fork out a couple of thousand rands for a, 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 a bumper bashing. Less, less relevant these days when we're all working from home, but we eventually will get onto the roads again. But start 10%, work it up to 15 and diversify that investment across multiple retirement type products um, is my guide to, to the audience. Thank you, Krant. You mentioned something very important. You spoke about risk. What if you are at this stage, the first stage, and you are a very risk-averse person? Because remember, our personalities are different. When we know that at this stage, this is when you should be taking the most amount of risk. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that individual who is just scared to take risk and go into equities? I think the the, the discussion you have to have with them is, is compare a product. So least risky product is cash. So you put it in a money market fund and you earn uh, prime, which is now up by a quarter of a percent, but then you compare it against the CPI rate over the last 10 or 15 years. If you continue contributing to a money market fund only in 10 or 15 years, CPI would have outgrown your contribution and then you'll have negative returns. So you have to add some sort of risk to your product. You don't have to buy Nuts that can move three or five percent a day. You can buy a diverse product or a balanced portfolio that smooths out the risk. 
but tries to beat inflation by three three to five percent, which is still in the medium risk category um, at this stage. Thank you so much, friends. And now we are moving on to stage two, which is rising salary and expenses. We all love this stage because now you're getting a little bit more income, but unfortunately your expenses as well are rising. Now, Tracy J, how did you balance the tightrope of saving for retirement, buying a car and property? So, Mapala, I was quite fortunate in the sense that I had this conscience tapping me on the shoulder the whole time because quite early on, you know, two years into my working career, I was developing these online tools that the audience used to see how much must I save, am I on track, all of these kind of things, you know, that plan is used to give you feedback. And it was like this tap on my shoulder the whole time. If you don't do something soon, <laughs> you're going to make it very, very tough for yourself later. I don't know if you guys remember that chicken licking ad with that monkey and as the craving gets bigger, so the monkey gets bigger and it was sort of like that. So quite early on, I, I, I did up my retirement contributions, but what that meant is I stayed at home for a few years initially while I was working, so paid my parents a small amount as opposed to a big rent. That gave me the benefit of actually being able to save for a car. I bought a secondhand car, not a new car, cash a few years into working. So I saved on the interest. And then when it came to buying a place of my own, after staying with my parents quite a few years, I was quite excited <laughs> to have my own space. Um, but what I actually did, and I think it's a great way to assess how much debt you can actually take on to balance that tightrope of saving versus debt um, versus living expenses, I set aside every month what I thought I could afford as a payment and rates and electricity and insurance and all of those other things that come with buying a property. And I thought I had plenty of margin and I did this for about six months. And actually what I learned is I'm going to have to live very tight and potentially I'm going to get into debt if something unexpected happens. So I actually reduced the sort of price range I was looking at when I, I bought my place. And I think that's a really great tip not to just do it for one month, but to do it for a few months so that those unexpected expenses like, oh, my car needs tires or something are accounted for when, when purchasing a property. And the key principle I'd say, and I think South Africans are quite guilty of this, is that the house you live in, whether it's a bond or a rent payment, and the car you drive is a lifestyle choice. It's not an investment. So if you want to walk that tightrope and you choose to spend it on your lifestyle and therefore you can't save and invest, as long as we're clear that we're making that decision and then we're not fooling ourselves into thinking, oh, but my house is an investment and I'm actually investing the money. And the sooner we make that call, the easier it is. It's much harder down the line when you're used to this amazing car and house to then go, I'm going to sell it and downscale. That, that, that's, that's really tough. But I think that's the key message is to assess your lifestyle and, and potentially adjust it if you need to. Yeah. I absolutely love that, Tracy. You know, one of the things I keep on saying is that <coughs> your accountability test, that's my dog is barking. Please give me a second. Apologies about that. So, Tracy M, what should you be considering in terms of estate planning during this stage? Well, Paula, I think during this stage, I think we must also just accept, you know, that unlike marriage, estate planning is not very romantic. Um, but I think like um, marriage, if we kind of use that as a comparison, um, estate planning can also be quite daunting for some people. Um, and I think that's why it's so important when it comes to estate planning that you do get expert advice. Uh, Chalilo spoke about it earlier, that you do speak to your wealth advisor. I think during this phase, though, what's also important is, is that generally we start transitioning away from thinking about ourselves. I mean, you mentioned it earlier, Mapolo, you need to update your will. You've now got a five-month-old child. Um, so we do generally start transitioning away from thinking about ourselves towards thinking about our children as we start having them, thinking about our spouses. And when I explained estate planning earlier, I said, for me, 
it's a collective term and it's really a building block approach that one should look at following in terms of estate planning. So at this particular stage, when you're married, when you've got children, when you've got commitments, it does mean that once again, if we start with the foundation, we need to look at the will. You need to make sure it's updated to your point, Mapolo. You need to make sure you nominate a guardian. Um, it also may be worthwhile at this stage to consider bringing in a testamentary trust to make sure that your, your children and any other vulnerable members of family are taken care of. Um, so at this stage, it does become a little bit more complex. We do need to look at the will a lot closer, make sure that there are guardians appointed. Um, we do also need to consider bringing in testamentary trust provisions. I think what's also important at this stage is, is to understand the cost of dying. And, and what I mean by that is, is that when we pass away, there are certain fees that become payable, whether it's estate duty, executor's fees, capital gains tax, there are fees that become payable. So it is important to understand what those costs are going to be and to make provision for them. Because what we wouldn't want, as an example, is we wouldn't want our house, the roof over the head of our children and spouses, to have to be sold in order to create liquidity to pay those costs. So at this particular stage, it does become a little bit more complex, and I think so we need to start introducing more of those different blocks, the building blocks, into the estate planning process. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. And I think it's so powerful um, to consult with your financial advisor or your wealth planner because there are so many technicalities when it comes to estate planning that you do not want to miss it. Exactly to your point, what you said, you do not want the roof over your kid's head to be taken away because you did not plan right. So I think it's very crucial at this stage to consult with the right professional. So now, Tracy, you left corporate world to start your own business. You are quite, <laughs> you are quite um, the uh, the rebel, I would say. <laughs> Tell us about your experience. So I think it it was quite a scary thing. I mean, I thought about it for a year a year before I actually did it. But the great benefit of that is it gives you time to save up. So I built up quite a buffer, knowing that you know it's tough to start your own business and adventure. And I, I know we said we are redefining retirement. So for some people, this, you know, this is also applicable at other life stages. But I really, I planned in that sense and I had a rough idea of what I wanted to do. And I actually had so many interesting things I thought I was going to do, sort of consulting on investments, but I did some work on retail shopping centers and foot traffic and cell phone towers. And it, it, it was actually quite interesting. And during that time, Ned Group actually spoke to me and I did some consulting work for them and I ended up back in corporate. But I must say, I, I really love working at Ned Group, so I can't complain. But I think the, the key messaging and when thinking about money that came out for me in this, during that transition period between resigning and leaving, I got offered a job in a private equity company. And for those who know private equity, when the fund matures, it pays, I mean, massive, massive bonuses if the fund's done well, like you can go buy a mansion. And I had this opportunity to join, to go right back into corporate before I've even left. And I must say, I did have to think about it for two weeks because now that when that opportunity is on the table, it's a different story. But I chose not to follow it. And I think that's my key messaging is money is there to serve a purpose you know we're not just talking about saving for the sake of saving and having more and i think it's really important to think about the journey you want to be on how you want to live your life how you want to define it what makes you happy and you saving to serve that purpose um often we see savings as grant was saying as a grudge purchase but actually it's there to help you reach your aspirations to help you reach your dreams and if you can build that kind of relationship with money as opposed to more is always better um i think that will go really a long way in your financial planning thank you so much Tracy. you mentioned that you started your business what i find is that a lot of business owners they often say i don't have any sort of retirement fund because my business is my retirement plan. What do you say to that? So that's a great question. My husband is in that bucket because he has his own business and I've been on his case. Um, 
And I think it is tough because you've got to balance your capital requirements of your business. And I know one of the things he falls into, and I'm sure many people have their own businesses, I'll do it later, but that that two years becomes a rolling two years and you never, you never reach it. And I think it's really important because if you think about it, all your money and your wealth is tied up in one single asset. So Grant was talking to risk. Now you're saying, oh, well, one day I'll sell my business when I retire. Your income is dependent on that. Your retirement is dependent on that. Your life savings are dependent on that. And that's a lot of risk to put in one bucket, one entity, not even diversify the cross company. So I'd really say for your own protection, and especially because creditors can't attach money in your retirement annuity. So if something does unexpectedly go wrong with your business, that money is safe. So again, coming back to your comment on pay yourself first, keep that money safe um, if something does happen. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I was about to say money in your retirement annuity, creditors cannot touch. And for me, that is a light bulb moment to say, you know what, um, you are controlling your risk then. So now, Chililo, if you are well read, you have access to information as people do now, and you feel that you can do your own retirement planning, why do why does one still need a financial advisor at this stage? Thanks, Mapolo. The good thing about being well read is that you are able to have a robust discussion with your financial planner. The reason that you would need a financial planner is because you are an expert in your field. You are well read. You are well informed. You do your own continuous professional development courses for your field. But for financial planning, you don't have time to look at the markets every single day. You don't have the support that a financial planner does. Does, And I'll be a bit controversial. It comes back to a topic that we all have an opinion about, about the education system in South Africa. It's very good. But let me just say mathematics and mathematic literacy. Yes. <laughs> So you need to be very, as much as you are well read, the financial planner is an expert. You, you do not have the rights. We are not like, we are, very, we are a small global village now because of the internet. We are not like the US where you can sue Mapolo for everything and anything because she did not address your specific situation in her personal finance column. But if you have a financial planner, planner, you can hold that financial planner accountable because they know your personal circumstances. They know the markets. They know what's available in the industry. Even when you look at our regulation, it says that we need to give you to explain to you the options that are available for your needs and put you in a position to make an informed decision. So the financial planner is not going to make a decision for you. He will take your opinion into account. He will take your circumstances into account and put you in a position to make an informed decision about your future, your goals, and your money. So that is why we always say, concentrate on your profession, be an expert in your profession, and leave the finances to the professionals. Thank you. I'm not going to add anything to that. I think you are spot on. <laughs> this is a very contentious one. Um, many people have asked me this. When changing employment, should you pay off your debt? We know the interest rate that is charged on your debt is much higher with your retirement savings, or should you continue with your retirement savings? Yeah, I think we've, we've all been in that position. Um, where suddenly you get a new opportunity, and uh, my uh, my dogs have taken their their lead to take their uh, their time. But <clears throat> the absolute joys of working from home. <laughs> so um, what happens is uh, when you change jobs, is generally a, a nice little uptick in your salary, uh, which comes back to the initial discussion around should I up my contribution firstly. But secondly, say for example, you started working 10 years ago and you earn 250,000 Rand and you contribute to 10% to that uh, retirement savings. And we use a, a pretty low estimate for equity growth of 7% per year. After 10 years, you will have pretty close to 300,000 Rand in your retirement savings. Now at that time, you might've built up some debt or you overextended yourself uh, because you haven't planned properly. And you think that 300,000 Rand can make a huge dent in your monthly expenses. But if you take the compound growth effect of taking the 300,000 Rand with no additional contributions at a growth of 7% for the next 30 years, 
that amount will exceed 2 million rand. So you've used 300,000 rand to pay off debt, but you've given upside away of 2 million rand. And that's the real effect of using retirement savings to paying off debt. So it's a big no-no in my world, and I think people should steer clear of, of using retirement savings to settle monthly recurring um, expenses. Yeah, I absolutely love that, Franz, because you are effectively giving up 2 million instead of 200,000 that you're looking at, or 300,000 rather. But I think another thing to add to that, and I know this is controversial, Franz, is that people will take this windfall, I, I, let's call it that, they pay tax on it, but oftentimes because people are in debt, they do not know the habits that got them into debt in the first place. So you find that they will repeat the circle later, two, two years later, they are back in debt because they never really confronted, why do I keep on getting into debt? So I think that's another thing to consider. So Just, yeah, I think it ties back to Tracy's comment around lifestyle choices. So that vicious circle will continue because people don't stay in jobs for 10 or 20 years any longer. There's a seven, five to seven year so you could repeat the cycle every five to seven years, uh, and then that compound growth effect is, is, is astronomical. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Now we are going to move to stage three, nearing retirement. I'm going to start with you, Tracy Jane. In this stage, people generally have more disposable income. What are the relevant considerations for this life stage? So yeah, Mopalo, that, that obviously brings a little bit of freedom to people. So for people who are looking to start their own business, their own side hustle, wanting to do something, they have got more money now to be able to do that. And what I would really suggest, and it's something I learned recently, actually, it was on a, a course I did, is what is the smallest experiment you can do in terms of money to test your idea? Because I've seen it with many people. Unfortunately, they take all their savings and they start this business and it doesn't work out the way they thought it was going to. So what is the smallest experiment you can do to, to test that so that you don't waste all of this extra disposable income and savings that you've built up? Then the second thing I'd say for, for this stage is to catch up on retirement contributions if, if you did get behind or if you cashed it in, as Grant was saying, as we know many, many, many South Africans do. Um, so sometimes you have to play catch up there. And then for those wanting to retire early, you really have to get serious now about increasing your contributions if that's your goal. And this is really where a financial planner can help you because they can tell you exactly what it is. To put it in perspective, if you say, I want to retire at 60 instead of 65, that's a double whammy impact because I'm saving for five years less, plus I need an income for five more years. And on top of that, I've missed it out on five years of compounding. So, you know, it's quite a big catch up. But if that is something that's important to you, I, I do suggest that you, you raise that with your planner and they can help you set what is the contribution you need to make to get there. Then the last consideration is really around the fact that often by this stage, you own some form of property or properties. So your wealth is quite skewed to a single South African investment in property. So when you look at your wealth and your savings and your investments holistically is to bear that in mind and potentially invest more of your formal savings in things like um, international to bring diversification, not potentially owning property or owning less property in your other savings to balance balance this out and in the in this savings mode where you have got the extra money is to really as soon as possible think about those estate planning structures so that you don't incur taxes and costs later when you have to change your structures but I'm not going to touch too much on that because I'm sure tra other Tracy is going to talk to that and which are, which brings us right into the next question for Tracy M Tracy M, when people start investing internationally, are there other death taxes they need to be aware of? If so, how should one plan for this? Absolutely, Mapolo. I mean, the short answer is yes, there are. But I think to Tracy J's comment, the minute one starts investing internationally, I think it's also important to understand the legal ownership option that you're investing through and what are the, the general estate and tax planning consequences linked to those different options. 
Because understanding that is the first step to making informed decisions. But to your particular question, Mapolo, in terms of are there other death taxes payable in other countries? Yes, there are. The reality is the minute we start investing internationally, we do need to consider what are the implications in the particular jurisdiction in which we're going to invest. Um, and they are most notably, I mean, if I think just from a US and a UK perspective, they are what we refer to as CITES taxes. So very briefly, if you hold assets that are situated in the US or the UK, um, they will be subject to death taxes in that particular jurisdiction. And if we look at the thresholds, I mean, from a UK inheritance tax perspective, the threshold is £325,000, above which this estate tax would kick in at a rate of 40%. And in the US, the threshold is £60,000. So any assets with a value above £60,000 would be subject to US federal estate taxes at a rate of 40%. Um, so one does need to be aware of these when one is looking to diversify their wealth and invest internationally. There are ways of, of getting around it, though, as well, Mapolo. So, I mean, just as an example, you know, if one was going to consider investing into shares that are that are registered in the US or the UK, one could rather get the same sort of exposure and perhaps even arguably diversify and go into a fund that's registered outside of those jurisdiction. So you get exposure to it without having to have the additional headache of having these estate taxes to carry. Another structure that a lot of people do use is to hold assets through an international endowment wrapper, because that also takes the assets outside of these regimes. No, fantastic. Thank you so much, Tracy. Now, Krant, this one is for you, and I know a lot of people are asking themselves this. When should one start investing in offshore products, and how easily accessible are these products? I think let's uh, address the second question first, how easy it is. I, I think with the introduction, uh, introducing of uh, electronic trading platforms locally and, and offshore, it is as easy as logging onto your, on your, onto your trading platform. The, 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 the question comes back uh, in addition to that is what, what assets do you invest in? And I think Tracy M mentioned endowment wrappers and the like are very tax efficient. You can then let, choose exactly the same product you were going to do in a personal share portfolio into the endowment wrapper uh, through the tax uh, um, efficiency of that product. And it gives you access to the bigger brands. You know, you can buy Microsoft, uh, Tesla uh, and the likes. If you don't want to go through an endowment wrapper, you can go through um, uh, offshore listed actively managed ETFs. And they are two companies that come to mind, iShares and Vanguard. They've been around many, many years. And they also make sure um, that that fund is not registered in those domiciliums, which can, can attract CITES around that. When do we start investing? I think with, uh, with the age of technology, I think you should have started yesterday. Um, if you think about the South African market, and we all, uh, with our own retirement funds, are very tied to the South African market, but there's only a top 40 shares that you would want to invest in, but it's very uh, concentrated because you have lots of banks, you've got lots of uh, concentrated risk in there. We know the concentration risk uh, brought through through NASPERS. So if you think about from the 40 shares, you should only be only be investing in 22 of those in a, in a, in a nice uh, local share portfolio. But then you should take the money offshore and then the world is your oyster. Most of our offshore platforms allow you to trade from Australia to uh, um, Canada um, and through real time trading. So the time is now start getting start speaking to a financial planner. It goes back to the risk question. What is your risk appetite? What is your goal? What do you want to achieve? Um, the South African market this year has done really, really well in turn, almost double digit returns, but the previous years were single digits or flat. The offshore market has been performing double digits for the last couple of years. So you can see how a nice packaged retirement plan with your financial advisor uh, would have compensated uh, for the lack of local performance. Thank you so much, Grant. I think from this conversation, what I'm getting is we need to diversify. and definitely those platforms that make it much easier to access. But now let us move to stage four, looking at the time. And the stage four is retirement. Now you have made it and hopefully you have used all the tips that our experts have spoken about throughout the different life stages. Now, Tracy J, 
retirement or terminating of formal employment is an emotional transition, to be honest, for many. What are some of the ways you have witnessed people deal with this transition? Thanks, Paulo. So we've actually done quite a lot of testing and we've we've met with a lot of people who are sort of in the space of one to two years from retirement. And I know one of the big things that come up is, oh, how am I going to live with my partner in my space all the time at work? I'm the boss or, you know, people value my opinion and listen to me. But at home, it's a different story. <laughs> so I do think one of the big, big transitions is how are you and your partner who now have been sort of living your own lives and touching base maybe briefly in the evenings going to recreate your life? And I think it's really important, whether it's financial planning or broader than that, is actually sitting together and deciding what is the life you want to create together? How do you want your life to look now? How are you, you know, going to coordinate this transition? So that's one of the, the really big areas. Another thing that came up so frequently, in fact, my one colleague who's um, in about her 50s, she said, sure, I need to start figure out a side hustle or business when I retire because almost everybody had a planned business or side hustle or something they were going to do. And I think... There's many great aspects about that. The one is, as we know, and we've we've discussed a lot, is most people haven't saved enough by the time they retire. And that just helps them basically draw less income initially so that their savings last longer. But more than that, one of the big things people grapple with is, do I still have self-worth? You know, my value add was in my job and now I don't have a job. Um, and this is a great way to still feel valued, to feel like you're still part of society and giving back. And the other, the other aspect of that that's very closely tied to it is volunteering. One of the things people absolutely love the concept of was, I have time now, I can give back, and it makes me feel like I'm still contributing to the world. I think just, just to wrap off, a great example is actually my uncle, he got forced to retire quite early. He was still in his 50s. And he decided to go do his master's. <laughs> so he did his master's in coaching. He's now got more than a thousand hours of coaching. He's internationally accredited, but he really sets his life and determines, you know, when he goes on holiday, how much coaching he does, so how much work he's doing versus how much he's actually doing the things he wants to get done in retirement. So I think yeah, those are the main things is looking at how you want to still give back, you know, is it a business, is it volunteering, resetting how you and your partner are going to live together, and yeah, defining how you want your life to be in that stage. Thank you so much, Tracy. You've touched on it a little bit, but most people are terrified that they will run out of money during retirement. How can they ensure that their money lasts for life? Yeah, so this was also one of the, the fascinating things. Even people who had 20 million, 30 million that we saw were just as, as nervous that they were going to run out. So I really think this is a universal thing. Now, one of the options is to purchase something called a guaranteed annuity. And I think Grant briefly mentioned it earlier. But this is something where you hand over your capital and in exchange, the insurer will pay you a guaranteed income for your whole life. And you can set up your partner on there as well. However, many people dislike this option because it does reduce your flexibility. And so once you've signed up, you can't ever change, you can't switch, you can't alter your income, you're getting the increases you agree to upfront. So what many people do is choose to manage it themselves. And there's three key principles in that case if you're going to manage it yourself. And there's actually isn't an attachment that the audience can view um, if they're interested. But the three principles are make sure you're not taking too much every year as an income. And we talk about a rule of thumb of 5%. And I'm going to use this, this coffee cup as an analogy. If this is my cup of coffee and I need to drink on this coffee for the rest of my life, I can only take small sips from my cup because if I'm taking too much at a time, it's not going to last. So you don't want to take out more than 5% a year to live off. Then the second aspect is fees. So you will be required to get a document that shows you something called your, um, your TIC and your planner will be able to help you with this. And this includes all the different costs 
that are involved. And that's like giving your cup of coffee to somebody else to sip, you know, so now somebody else is sipping. So again, you don't want too much to be taken out of the cup every year. And then the last one is actually to have sufficient growth assets. So you are still a long-term investor. At age 60 in South Africa, males have a life expectancy of 20 year, 25 years and females 30 years. And these three principles, we, we actually did an analysis um, for Tandi and she was making the common mistake. She was taking a little bit too much as income. Her fees were too high and she was concerned about markets. So she had a low growth portfolio. And just by changing these three things, her income lasted 25 years longer. So it's three very little things, but that are very powerful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Now, over to you, Tracy. Um, would it be a good time during the stage to evaluate beneficiaries as with their own life stage? And what impact does um, um, what impact does estate planning have at this stage? So, Mapola, it indeed would be a good time to evaluate beneficiaries. Um, I think what is important when we start looking at beneficiaries is we also need to ensure that if, for example, they are going to stand to inherit large sums, that those inheritances are structured in such a way that we actually take care of the beneficiary, we protect them from themselves potentially. Um, so in the scenario where, as an example, there may be an addict um, as a beneficiary, uh, there could be a spendthrift beneficiary, you really want to make sure that their inheritance is, is going to be protected as far as possible. And that's generally where the concept of a, of a trust works really well. So instead of a beneficiary receiving a huge lump sum, that could be held in trust for them and they could have access to income or capital if they require. But there's actually safeguards that are built in. I would argue, though, Mapola, that it's not just this stage. I think it would be throughout the different life stages that one needs to really assess whether or not a beneficiary is able to inherit funds outright. Thank you so much, Tracy. Now, are trusts still relevant for estate planning if beneficiaries are living overseas? Good question, Mapolo. And, you know, the reality is, is that the concept of a trust dates back to the Crusades. So I think what we are seeing today is we're seeing people establishing trusts for the right reasons. There was a stage where, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry effectively had a trust. Um, but they are being established for the right reasons. And just some briefly, I know we're starting to run out of time, but just briefly, some of the reasons why one should consider establishing a trust, it would be the traditional reason. So it's, it's around trying to protect assets for beneficiaries. And as I said earlier, sometimes it's it's protecting beneficiaries from themselves. Um, you know, when you, your comment around people looking to emigrate and, you know, is, is trust still a viable option in that regard? I think also bear in mind that you can establish trusts internationally in other jurisdictions. The minute one starts considering emigrating, it does start adding a further level of complexity purely because you need to take into account what is the legislation in the country to which you're immigrating and how do they view trusts? Because ultimately you want to make sure that you have a structure that is going to be a viable structure effectively to hold your wealth. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, Chililo, to you. At retirement, of course, one does cash out their investments within the confines of the retirement fund rules. Will they still need a financial advisor? You always need a financial advisor, Mapolo. Um, your financial advisor is almost central to everything that we've spoken to about today. So your financial advisor will be your touch point that would connect you to a Tracy for estate planning that would connect you to a grant for for trading as well. And they would also worry about your finances while you are worried about what Tracy was talking about, how to live with your spouse, what to do after retirement, how to tolerate each other. But the, the most important thing I would like everybody to take away from this is that it is very critical to have a financial plan at every stage of your life. But at retirement, it's even more critical because they are there to assist you to see how that your money lasts as long as you would expect to live. And if you live beyond expected time, the money should still be there to support you as well. 
And also not only that, but also to make sure that it is structured properly. And then we have some specialized areas, like for example, your, your GPF, if I can just share a, a, a legal funny anecdote that made a very critical difference in people's life. For example, if somebody is with the GPF, we know their benefits, they are very good and all that. But for my African speaking colleagues, you find that the form comes in and say F3 or A3. And if you don't understand the difference there, you can fill in the, the wrong text form and then you pay a huge amount of tax unnecessarily where you thought you were retiring whereas you actually resigned. And it, it, it makes a huge difference to have a financial planner there who understands the, com the complication and the complexities that come with post-retirement. Thank you so much, Lilo. Now, the last question, looking at the time, it's never, ever enough. Kron, do you ever stop reviewing your investments? I think the short answer is no. I think if you think about uh, at retirement, uh, even if you were a prudent saver and you contributed as much as you can, most people will receive the biggest lump sum they've ever received in one go at retirement. And that is where your financial planner needs to assist you. There's loads of post-retirement products available for you that can deliver on your goals still. You still have goals. You still want to travel internationally. You still want to go and visit your grandkids in whichever country they are living in now. Uh, and the likes. So it's quite important that you that you maintain that uh, review, get the, the right person to look after your finances. If you look at a practical example, how many people have won the lotto? How many people still have the money five years after they won the lotto? This is your lotto. This is your payout when you go in retirement and you don't want to spend it within the first five years. And because you're not financially savvy, you need to look at a, a financial markets professional and to fulfill that role for you. Thank you so much, Brand. Now we have come to the end of our discussion, but before we go, let's take a look at the results from our polls. Let us see what the poll says. I think someone from the technical team will also show you the results. So, my concept of retirement is, for a lot of people said, the end of formal employment to start a new chapter, adventure, or business. And I think that is brilliant because it shows that for a lot of people, it is not the end, it is only the beginning of a new chapter. Given your concept of retirement, how are you preparing? A majority of people said, I have set specific goals and actions to achieve them. So this webinar, definitely we are talking to the right people who are doing the right things to achieve their retirement goals. So thank you so much for taking, taking your time to do the, the questions. And another question is, given your concept of retirement, how are you preparing? Okay, it is the same question. I think it was only two questions. Excuse me for that. So I think people are preparing quite well for their retirement, but I hope that through this webinar, we've encouraged you to absolutely consult with a financial planner. I think <laughs> Chilulu has drilled that into us. Diversify your investments and make sure that you plan around your estate planning. And I think what Tracy brought in was very crucial, looking at your life holistically, looking at yourself and saying, what is the type of lifestyle I want for myself currently at whatever stage you're in and planning for retirement. So thank you so much. We have reached the end of our webinar. Thank you to the panelists and the audience for participating. We hope that through this webinar, we have shared insights that will con connect your financial decisions today to your future that you want. Over to you, Tracy M. 
Thank you, Mapolo, and thank you to the panel. It's really been great to participate in this discussion today. It's always unfortunate when you're passionate about something, you seem to run out of time, um, but it's really been get great to engage with you all. So thank you very much for that. I think just a reminder to the audience, um, at, at NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning, we remain committed to providing you with global, globally integrated advice and really looking at how can we connect you to more ways to manage and keep track of your financial affairs. Planning for your retirement throughout the different life stages or throughout life's journey is one of the cornerstones of financial planning. And really, if we look at how can we help you, we have a team of wealth advisors who are supported by specialists such as the panel members today. And together, we can help you prepare a financial plan and really, most importantly, help you realize your retirement goals. So in closing, um, if you would like to be invited to one of our smaller, more interactive sessions, we're going to be holding a smaller conversation starter session in the next two weeks. The title of the conversation starter is a small change today for the retirement you want, starting with the end goal in mind. If you'd like to attend that conversation starter, please just pop your first name and surname into the chat on the left-hand side of your screen. And don't worry because only the administrator will have access to that information. But if you'd like to join, please just let us know by popping your name in the chat box. Please remember that you can get more thought leadership insights and the recordings of our previous webinars and details around our future webinars from our website. So please do have a look at that. Importantly, your views matter to us. You'll receive a feedback request in the next few days. So please share with us your feedback in terms of how you believe we could improve our webinars going forward. Finally, but by no means least of all, thank you to each of you for joining our webinar today. We look forward to connecting with you soon again in the future, but until then, go well and stay safe. Thank you.